Hey guys, thanks very much for clicking on this episode. Slightly different one in the sense that I'm going to do two things today. We've had loads of rain, everything's really damp. I'm going to get a fire going and cook up some food. But later this afternoon, I'm actually going out with a shotgun with my buddy George at his farm. But for the meantime, so stick around if you want to watch that. That will be that segment will hopefully come after this bit. And it's really windy. I've come to a different area of the woodland because I had a comment from a young boy of about, I don't know, 13, I think he was. I can't remember his name. And he was saying he's really struggling with flint and steel fire lighting. Uh, and he's just really struggling to get fire going with it. So I thought I'd uh, give some tips really on flint and steel fire lighting, especially in damp conditions because it's, it's a relatively tricky technique anyway, uh, in the dry conditions, but when things are damp and when your materials are damp, it's actually quite a difficult form of fire lighting. So I'll just give you guys some tips on what, what I tend to do when it's wet for flint and steel. We'll get some food going, obviously, gotta get some food going. Uh, overcast day, not too cold, but it is wet and it's forecasted showers, that's why I've got some rain gear on. Um, but I brought some a bit more traditional gear with me. I've got a waxed canvas backpack over there, which I'll tell you about later. But that's actually made for me um, by a guy on Instagram called Meandering Maker. He makes some awesome stuff. So I'll show you that backpack. Uh, and I've got a traditional flint and steel kit as well, which I wanted to show you. So let me go and get that for you now, and then we'll get this fire going. So this is the, the fire lighting kit that I've got and that I'm going to use. I bought this from a website called Beaver Bushcraft. It's run by Mark and Helen Horden. I saw them at the Bushcraft show and I saw this on their stand. They sold out really fast um, and I kept monitoring their website afterwards. They're really nice people. And yeah, I bought this from their website. This is Helen, I think, makes all the leather shark design. She's got these cool uh, shark logos and things. But this is just the uh, leather carrying case. And inside I've got just a bit of cloth to keep this copper Tin. This is pretty awesome. This is a Hudson Bay, HBC, Hudson Bay Company style oh, tinder box, basically. And in there, I've got flint here, pieces of flint. I've got my steel striker there. I've got some rope here, which, you know, I can just fluff up. I've got some char cloth as well. Another big piece of flint. And then some amadou, which is from the... Uh, uh, a species of fungi that you can um, boil up and then dry and you get this almost char cloth like material but it's it's completely 100% natural from the amadou it's called amadou so uh, yeah that's I believe I don't know if it was the native Indians that, that came up with this first I don't know too much about the history of where, how, where this material was made first but that's kind of what's in it and it's also quite cool because on the tin on the top there's actually a magnifying glass there as well, so you can do some fire by sunlight and uh, magnifying glass, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, a, a really nice traditional piece of kit that um, I'll put a link to in the description to the website where I bought it from. I think they only sell it on their website, I'm not sure if they do other ones. but So I'm going to take a piece of flint. This is a piece I've used before. You can see I've, I've bashed it up a bit. Obviously, I'm going to take my steel striker and then some char cloth. Now this char cloth isn't amazing. I prefer using bits of towel and things like that. I don't think this is towel. This looks like it's quite flat there. You want a really fluffed up char cloth, but I'll get two pieces of that just in case because it does shred up after a while. Keep it all together. And yeah, copper tarnishes really easily. You can see it gets that green tarnish on it. So I, where your moisture on your hands touch it, it just goes a bit funny. So. I tend to keep that wrapped up anyway. In there, we're getting there. So that's a cool piece of kit. It's nice and traditional, and I like using traditional gear. I'm swaying towards traditional gear, it's quite nice. It's heavier, but it's more authentic, and it just makes you appreciate what our ancestors had to work with. Essentially, you obviously don't need to hit this whole kit. All you really need is a piece of flint some steel, you can use the back of some carbon knives, 
they've got a nice 90 degree spine and some char cloth which is really easy to make. Obviously the most important thing for any fire lighting is getting your resources prepped and ready beforehand. So I've got some oak and some pine there, some really dry dead oak, Scots pine here, some pine twigs and some oak twigs in there as well. Some more oak here, dead, completely dry, it was hanging from a tree, you can see it's nice and dry. Collected some grass, now this is damp, this doesn't look it but it's wet damp grass because we had lots of rain. I found a nice bit of birch bark. Now I could use the scrapings from that and just get fire going much easier, but the whole point is this is a flint and steel tutorial bit. So that's going to keep all my materials dry as I light them. And as that fire builds, it's also going to protect the moisture because this is soaking. You can see it's absolutely soaked. So essentially that's what this flat piece of birch is going to be for, like a fire lay, really. And then I've got birch scrapings here again. These are soaking wet, but birch is really good in uh, wet conditions. Yeah, so to the kid who wanted to know about I, don't, I can't remember your name, so just listen carefully, boy. Listen carefully to these tips. What you've got to do with your wet tinder is really fluff it up. This is just grass, dry, dead grass. It's not dry, but I'm drying it out by ripping up, breaking up all those fibres and just buffing it, really, like this to expose the dry inner fibres of the, the grass because that's what you want. This outside stuff is completely soaked. Any little twigs, pull out because they're wet as well. So this is still wet and this takes a while and the, the more you do this, the fluffier it gets. You try and just rip it up and you can see it's starting to get a bit fluffier but I'm gonna do this for about, I don't know, a couple of minutes really because the prep is important and it needs those fibers to be exposed. So keep doing it, keep ripping up the grass because that's what's gonna get the dry inner fibers of the grass exposed a bit better. There might be some <clears throat> light aircraft flying over because there's a little small aircraft field not far from here. So apologies if it flies over midway through fire lighting, which it most definitely will, because it always seems to happen. And it just sounds really annoying when I edit it back. I've seen a buzzard today, lovely big, big buzzard, bird of prey. Two kites, red kites, plenty of gray squirrel, always in here. And there's some evidence of some deer trails not far from here, some game trails. I might show you in a bit. Right, so I've ripped that up, fluffed it up a bit more. This is still going to be hard to take. I might fail at this, who knows? It's, it's very difficult with, with wet, a wet tinder bundle. In, you know, if I was doing, if I needed to light a fire in these conditions, I wouldn't really do flint and steel. I'd just use the birch bark because that's amazing when everything is soaked and I'd get this fire going no problem, but that's not the point, is it, Mike? We've got to help this little boy learn some fire lighting tips, so fluff it up good. So there we go. Made a little bird's nest, made a little divot there. It's important you make that divot. I'll explain why later. These oaks are acting as a brace, really, so I'm going to lean the sticks up against that. It allows some airflow underneath. Uh, it also dries them out and hopefully they should catch as well. I've cleared all the, this is all damp ground, I've cleared all the leaves, that's another important thing, clear all the leaves, but this is soaking wet so it'll be fine. Flint, sti flint steel, char cloth. Let me explain what I'm going to do now. Yeah, I'm going to leave this all in one shot I think. I'll try and do this. Well, actually let me explain what I'm going to do first and then I'll move the camera. So what you want to do, find your sharp edges of the flint. It's fairly obvious which one it is. Hold your char cloth against it. Now, like I said, this charcoal's not very good, so it's going to take a few strikes. But if, you see, if I zoom in a bit, what you want to leave is about a two millimeter gap. You want to leave a gap from here to your charcoal. That way, when you strike down, the sparks go up, and generally that way. But they, they, if you're striking down the spark, a few sparks will go down, but most should tend to go up here. If you've got this too too far over, you're just going to smother your spark, and you're, it, it's going to almost extinguish your spark straight away. So you need a little bit of a gap like that just a couple of millimetres just so you can see it that way when you strike down if I really whack it there you go there's a spark already and that's glowing but I'll put that out because I want to do it from a different angle so <clears throat> the other thing is uh, your wrist it, it's all in the wrist with flint and steel so you see people completely bashing it and smashing it and really really hard you don't need to it's just a flick of your wrist almost 
all, all flint, all uh, steel strikers are, are fairly different, but they have the same principle design. You've got your straight piece here, and that's the piece that you want to meet on the sharp edge of the flint. So you're coming down on it like that, and the more material you scrape, the more chance you're going to get a spark. Um, and each time you're going to dull the edge, so you want to try and if you keep going and it's too dull and you're getting no sparks, move along to, a, to further down or further up from the, the uh, flint and work on another edge. Sometimes you have to flip it over, but yeah, just work around the edge. So once that's lit, I'm going to blow that like I was doing just then to get a nice good ember. Then I'm going to place it into this tinder bundle. The hard bit is getting this tinder bundle to go up and the harder bit is getting the this, when this is in flame, to then take on the sticks. And that's where the birch bark comes in because I'll be putting this birch bark on top because if this catches, it's going to burn a lot longer. This is almost like a flash tinder. It's very fast. So it's going to go out very fast. This is a bit more slower burning, this birch bark. So if I can get these on top and they light, then we're in. We should get a fire going. So let's give it a go now. Right, here we go. Flint and steel in the wet conditions. If this was raining, I almost certainly wouldn't use this technique probably, but it's handy to know. So same again, striking down with the wrist. Right, there's my charred material. At this point, there's no rush really, but I wanna get it, get it in there to dry out this material as well. There's not much charcoal off here, so I'm gonna put that other bit in as well. Long, slow breaths now. So what's happening, where I've blown that, that's now gone out that flame by the way, but this is a real time situation. What is happening is, this grass is so wet, there's not enough charcoal in there, that it's, it's basically burning out. It, it's, it's burning, but it's not hot enough to ignite the grass. But that's okay, that, that was a failed attempt, but that's fine because that's now dried out that inner bit of grass. Where that heat was, I can feel that's really dry in there. So, we do the same again, we get a bit more char cloth. If I can find it. A bit more char cloth. Now I'm running out of char cloth already, which is typical. But what I might do is, is have some amadou here as well. Because that will light, if I put that there. Use what you've got in your kit, adapt. If you've got more char cloth, add more char cloth to it because you want a good bundle of char cloth when it's wet. Now, practice what you preach. Now let's ignite some amadou. Put them both in there. Now this is the bit that's hard. You just need one birch bark piece to light.
Now that wasn't easy. You can see, let me keep the camera running. That was really difficult because that was, it was so wet. It was just so wet, it was going out all the time, but I had to keep adding loads of oxygen. So that's your key, is materials, oxygen. At this point, all this wood is still wet, so I've got my small sticks on. Get your big sticks on as well, because it's gonna dry it all out. So get a load of sticks on there. Whenever it's wet, get a load of sticks on. I'm not gonna smother it, because there's loads of air there. It's gonna be a smoky fire, because it's wet, but just goes to show you, force that oxygen in there, drying out that material, Sorry, the camera's getting really smoked, but I'll try and move it a bit. Dry out that material, force the oxygen in there, and now, by putting all these sticks on, which are soaking wet, except these dry oak ones, it's just gonna keep blowing through, and it will smoke to begin with, and then we'll get a clean burn. At this point, I need to go looking for more firewood. Let's get it all on there. That's okay. So hopefully that helped the young lad out there who wanted to know a little bit about flint and steel fire lighting in damp conditions. Cooked up some food. That was my breakfast for today. So hopefully now I'm gonna go with George, my buddy George. I've got to get back, get my shotgun, get my cartridges. <clears throat> we're gonna head out. It's 12 o'clock, 12.30 now. It's dark at four, so we're probably only gonna get about, by the time we're out there, I don't know, two hours of shooting maybe. But we can hopefully shoot into the twilight uh, twilight area, twilight zone. And maybe if we get a pigeon, maybe we'll uh, cook it up for you. But it's, it's very time dependent. I'm going to New York tomorrow. I've bought my wife for our wedding anniversary. I bought my wife, Emmy, two tickets to New York. So I'm coming to America, people. Going to, I think we're staying in uh, Midtown. Yeah, we're staying in Midtown in a hotel. Uh, so when you guys are watching this, we will be in New York already. Maybe if you want to follow my Instagram, you can keep up to date with that. I'll do some posts. And uh, yeah, so that's a Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, and then I'm back. <clears throat> and then there's gonna be some change on the channel for sure. Um, I'm gonna mix things up a bit. I'm gonna change things up. It's too repetitive at the moment. It's too samey. Yeah, things are gonna change for the good. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it anyway, but for the good, I'm, I'm hoping you will, uh, you'll like the content that's gonna come. It's definitely gonna be slightly different. It's, it's time for a change, well overdue a change. But um, yeah. Thanks very much for watching. If you're still watching this far, I'm gonna grab this bag, I'm gonna grab my shotgun, and we're gonna go hopefully try for some pigeon. I'd appreciate it if you were able to watch this all the way through. Uh, it would really help benefit the channel. And let's see how it goes.
play the waiting game or keep on moving. Yeah, I <coughs> don't know. It's hard to tell. It's out. We've got 20 minutes. We went to half an hour before we could have to leave here and get into the next field. Okay. We'll sweep round to see if we can have any luck there. I might be the way of doing it, I don't know. What, sit here first? Yeah. Like for yeah. 20 minutes? Yeah. And yeah. then, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, otherwise we're going to complete the circuit and we'll. Yeah. And they'll just be flying off, like. That's close. <laughs> he went over here, didn't he? <laughs> Something. No, it's fine. I just, I, I thought, thought I, I, thought, I, didn't think you were I thought you were going for those two. Yeah, I so didn't think you were loaded up. No, it's fine. No, come back round. Yeah, but I just saw them and I was like, that's a different flight path. You absolutely, that went down like a stone. <laughs> yeah, like you definitely hit that clean. Is he coming back? He, he was somewhere. <laughs> this could be fun. No, I missed him. Huh? Did you find it? Maybe he was further over like here. <laughs> Well done, George, mate. Dinner for the evening. Dinner sorted. That's a good size. That's a mallard, isn't it? Yeah, good it's size. a mallard, yeah. yeah. Just coming in for, coming in to roost. Twilight, to yeah. yeah, twilight. Good it's, effort. Yeah, been off on the pigeons all day. It was a nice way to top it off. It was, wasn't it? Had a couple of steel shot cartridges in my pocket. Yeah. Always, always do this time of year. Yeah, yeah, you got to, you got to. <laughs> yeah. Season's almost over now as well. So you've got I know, it's going fast, isn't it? No, well, it's always been good to get out. Mate, today. it's been good. Good to see you. Good to see you too, buddy. I've missed, uh, I've missed some um, pigeon shooting. I've missed I quite a few today. Well, but we'll get there in the end. This thing is just filling out as well. We know where spots are in the wood where yeah. we want to be getting to. Yeah. With the trees, kind of trees are coming into roost at. So it's just about getting back there and making sure that we're yeah. and in we, the right place at the right time. We reckon back end of season we'll get some... Uh, We'll some get, good shooting in. Yeah, we'll get some good pheasants out. There's plenty of movement around. Yeah, that's a good shot.